Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, welcome to our 2,200th episode special. Thank you to the support of our listeners who've helped us make it this far. You can support the show, support.greatdetectives.net, or become an ongoing supporter of the program, patreon.greatdetectives.net. Today, we're going to bring you an episode of the Lux Radio Theater. This was based on a 1947 film, though this episode was made in 1949. The original air date is November the 7th of 19. And this one is The High Wall. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Van Heflin and Janet Lee in High Wall. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Millions of Americans stay up long past bedtime to explore the fascinating world of whodunit. Because the mystery story is a standby of modern entertainment. It intrigues presidents and producers and plain people alike. And tonight, we present a classic in the field, the metro goldwyn Mayer hit High Wall. Starring in this drama of suspense and romance, you'll hear an old favorite of yours, Van Heflin, along with a bright new star making her first appearance here tonight, Miss Janet Lee. But however much you enjoy suspense in a mystery play... It's something uh, you don't want in your own home. And that's where Lux Flakes come in. In caring for fine materials, there's no suspense when you trust the job to Lux Flakes. Our stars are on stage, and the curtain rises for the first act of High Wall, starring Van Heflin as Steve Kennett and Janet Lee as Dr. Ann Lorison. <laughs> Police headquarters in a large city, the Central Homicide Bureau. Won't you sit down, Mr. Whitcomb? Thank you. Well, we were lucky to find you tonight. My name's Wallace, Assistant District Attorney. Well, I would have been here sooner, Mr. Wallace, but they asked me to identify the body. Mrs. Kennett was my secretary. Your manager of the Brattle Press, is that correct? Yes, a publishing house. Religious and educational textbooks. This is shocking, Mr. Wallace. What happened? Well, she was strangled sometime late this afternoon. Well, if I can be of any help, any information. Have you any? Well, I don't really know. Perhaps it has no bearing, but Mrs. Kennett's husband returned home today after an absence of two years. You know him? No, I never met him. I was out of my office most of the day. When I returned, they told me he'd been there, Mr. Kennett. He was looking for his wife. Very agitated, they said. Well, wasn't she there? No, she wasn't. I sent Mrs. Kennett to my home to pick up some manuscripts. Did they tell that to Kennett? Why, yes, of course. Oh. Did Mrs. Kennett return to the office? No, but under the circumstances, we thought nothing of it. We all assumed she went straight home with her husband. Perhaps if you can find Mr. Kennett. Oh, we've found him all right. They've got him in the next room. Let's see what he's told them. All right, Kennett. We'll go over it once again. The two of you were in your wife's car, and you deliberately drove it off the bridge. Isn't that right? Oh, come in, Wallace. Mr. Whitcomb, Inspector. We'll be through in a minute. Well, Kennett? But I told you what happened. After you strangled her, you wanted it to look like an accident, a broken neck and an auto crash. But you knew you could walk away from that kind of an accident, didn't you? I told you that I killed her in the park, and then I tried to kill myself. That's good enough for me, Inspector. It isn't often they come this easy. Dr. Adams here wants us to stall a while. That's right, Wallace. I've examined him. Drunk? No, but he's been through some recent head surgery. What's that got to do with it? Well, as police surgeon, I can't pass him. Then I have to look him over at Psychiatric. But he's confessed. I'm sorry, but he's got to go to Psycho first. Well, let's get it over with. Come on, Kenneth. Let's go. A tragedy, Mr. Wallace. 
A young man like that. Uh, You can never tell, Mr. Whitcomb. He had a fine war record, too, so his wife told me. A few hours ago, he committed murder. If there's anything else I can do... Well, we'll probably need you when he comes to trial. I'll let you know, Mr. Whitcomb. So I've called the staff together because I have some rather interesting x-rays to show you. I believe you have the report from the admitting desk, Dr. Lorison? Uh, yes, Dr. Dunlap. The patient's name is Stephen Kennett, age 34. Admitted Monday for observation, confessed to murder of wife and attempted suicide. Exhibited violence at time of admission, now confined in Ward C isolation. Any apparent cause for this violence? Dr. Powlett? Uh, the clerk at the desk was making a routine inventory of the patient's possessions. There was a snapshot of a child, a little boy. Kennett wanted to keep the picture. And since then? No violence, but the patients remain sullen and uncooperative. But I believe you've spent more time with them than I have, sir. Now, if you'll turn out the light, we'll have a look at these x-rays. Here we are. Now, you'll see here a subdural hematoma of the left frontal lobe. This blood clot is causing pressure on the brain. As you know, such pressure can produce both physical and emotional changes, and true to form, the patient has shown irritability, local pain, and lapses of memory. Lights, please. You've checked his physical condition again, Dr. Power? Uh, Yes, sir. Heart, blood pressure, respiration, normal. Then there seems no need to delay. Dr. Lorison, you'll prepare Mr. Kennett for surgery. Yes, doctor. Morning, doctor. Nice, quiet morning so far. Hello, Delaney. Where's the new patient, Stephen Kennett? Right here at 11. Better watch him. He's real antisocial. Open up for me, will you, Delaney? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Kennett. I'm Dr. Lawrenson. You can wait outside, Delaney. But I think I'd better... Wait outside, please. You're going to be one of my patients, Mr. Kennett. Get out. Would you care to tell me anything? What about those headaches, I said get out. Mr. Kennett, we're very fortunate to have a neurosurgeon like Dr. Dunlap, and he feels certain he can remove the cause of your headaches. He does, huh? Yes, he does. Now, if you'll just sign here, giving us your consent, we can... Surgery? Get... Oh, no. No, I let him do that before. Now get out of here and cut up some other guinea pig. Very well, Mr. Kennett. The orderly's name is Delaney. If you have any pain, he'll call me. Lock up, Delaney, that's all. <laughs> That's it, Mr. Wallace. Kennett's refused the operation. Of course he's refused. Sit the law out, stall for time, and come to court and get an acquittal on a plea of temporary insanity. The court sent him here for observation, and we'd like to continue along those lines. I don't want Kennett psychoanalyzed. I just want him cleared for trial. He's sane. I'm talking about legal sanity. Did he know the difference between right and wrong when he murdered his wife? Did he, Mr. Wallace? Why, of course he did. Examine his background. He was a bomber pilot. He married during the war, head injury in combat. Operation performed in Army Hospital, yes, and successfully, too. Want to see that report again? What about after the war? He was restless, had to keep moving. He went to Burma flying freight. Left his old mother and his wife and his child here. Mrs. Kennett got a secretarial job. I suppose she had to. What point are you making? Just this. A month ago in Burma, he was in a slight crack-up. Oh, here. Here's a cable from the doctor who examined him. Advise Kennett, second operation imperative... Warned him possibility of violent headaches, fainting spells, and loss of memory. Oh, well, that's exactly what Dr. Dunlap says. You see, Mr. Wallace, that accident following the initial surgery resulted in a blood clot that's pressing on the brain. Sure, that's his defense. He was planning to use this doctor's diagnosis as a license to murder his wife. I'm sorry, but we can't certify as to his sanity until we observe him after he's had a second operation. And he refuses it. His mother's consent is all you need. She's not very well at the moment, but you shouldn't have any trouble with her. We prefer having his consent. But if you insist, we'll see her today. Can you take care of that, Dr. Lorison? Yes, I think so. He'll pull through the operation, won't he? No reason why he shouldn't. Good. I'd hate to lose him. Feeling better, Mr. Kennett? Today was visiting day, Dr. Lorison. Yes? Why didn't I see my visitor? And don't tell me that my mother wasn't here. You're entitled to see visitors, and your mother was not here. Thanks, that's all I wanted to know. That pleases you, doesn't it? You've been hoping your mother would take your son away, where no one would know him, where no one could tell him about you. 
Your time is valuable, Doctor. Don't waste it. You can't talk me into that operation. I was hoping you'd changed your mind. No trial, no, no operation. I'll be here permanently, right? Possible. All right, then how about uh, getting me out of this chicken coop? I rate the ward, don't I? Some pretty nice people in the ward. All in all, it's, it's not a bad setup. Room and board, lots of company, radio, library, and all for free. Mr. Kennett, I'm sorry that I have to tell you this, but your mother died this morning. What are you trying to do to me? Dr. Powell and I went to your house. We found her on the floor. You know she'd been ill, chronic heart condition. Well, apparently recent events were too much for her. Oh, but, but don't let that alter your decision to stay here, Mr. Kennett. Your son will be taken care of in the county orphanage. Where is he now? What are they doing to him? Well, he's all right. I know now why you object to surgery. You don't want to go to trial, do you? You know there's a chance of acquittal on the grounds of temporary insanity, but you don't want to risk it. Oh, you'd rather spend your life here than face your child again. You want to escape from a reality, and you can. But do you know what happens to a child when he suddenly loses his entire family? Do you know what life is like for an orphan in a public institution? Oh, oh yes, you'll escape reality, Mr. Kennedy, but your son will I not... I don't have to listen to this. You can't make me listen. You've heard all I have to say. Lock up, Delaney. <laughs> And there are times when I simply don't understand you bringing a child here, a strange child you don't even But I know. told you, Aunt Martha, I... Well, I, I just can't see a child in that state of shock put in a public institution. You'll be put in a public institution yourself for kidnapping. <laughs> no, no, it's quite legal. They gave me temporary custody. Now, now, how is he? Is he asleep? I don't think so. He didn't touch a bite of supper. Oh. Well, let me bring it back to him and I'll... I'll see what I can do. I, I like the room. I don't want to go downstairs. Well, then you stay right here, just as long as you like, dear. Well, I, I see you still have your kitty. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I, uh, I brought back your supper, Richard, just in case you get hungry a little later on. And if you want anything, you'll call me, won't you? Do you know my name? Yes, ma'am. It's Anne. That's right. Grandma said Daddy was coming home. I waited for him, but he never came. Well, your Daddy wants you to stay with me for a little while. You know, I'll bet that kitty's hungry, too. Suppose you feed her. Here, here I'll pour a little of your milk in the saucer. I'll be back a little later, dear, when it's time to go to bed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'll get it, Aunt Martha. Hello? This is Dr. Dunlap, Ann. Well, congratulations. Oh, for what? Well, I don't know what tricks you use, but they certainly worked. Kenneth's going through with the operation. He actually asked for surgery. Oh, that's fine, Doctor. I'm really pleased. Thank you for calling me. You don't seem to understand, Mr. Kenneth. I'm your lawyer. I've been appointed by the court to defend you. Why, ever since you had that operation, I've been working day and night on this case. For five weeks, I've That's been... very uh, nice, Mr. Hacker, but uh, you're moving a little too fast for me. For one thing, I'm still a patient in this hospital. Well, I can't keep you here. The operation was a success. We have no intention of keeping Mr. Kennett here any longer than we have to. Meanwhile, there's something that I want you to do for me. My son's in an orphan asylum. I want you to arrange his release. That's the first thing. You don't really mean that. Why not? Man alive, you're knocking the props out from our whole defense. I'm counting on your son. On the day the case goes to the jury, I'll bring that child into the courtroom. In the gray clothes of the orphan asylum, his face pale. Why, that frail, pathetic little creature is the backbone of our case. Mr. Hackle, they've given me back my clothes, my belt, and my tie. I don't want to go back into isolation. That's the only reason I'm not going to break your neck. Well... Uh, obviously, you're not prepared to discuss your defense at all. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, you may phone me when he's a little more rash. I'll be glad to, Mr. Hackle. 8,000 decent lawyers in the state, and they have to pick him. Tell me something. How much longer before I, I'm sent to the county jail? Well, there's still several tests we want to make. Why? Once I'm out of here, I can hire the kind of a lawyer I need to get my boy out of that orphanage and into a good school. Mr. Kennett, Richard's not in an institution. He's living with a private family. But how did that happen? 
Well, we decided he needed personal care. He's staying with the Mrs. Martha Ferguson. She was delighted to have a youngster in the house, and oh, he's doing fine. I don't know how to thank you. Well, now before you can get out of here, I'm going to have to prepare a full report about you. So shall we go to my office and start making those tests? He's doing fine, you said. He's doing fine. Puzzled, Anne. First, you say you've made all the routine tests, and now you tell us you can't make an official report. I can't, Dr. Dunlap. I'm convinced that Kenneth is still concealing something. The district attorney's been on my neck for days. We can't keep Kenneth if he doesn't belong here. And what makes you say he's concealing something? Many things, Dr. Powered. But I can't tell you if it's deliberate or not. The police will say it is deliberate, that Kenneth planned to murder his wife and plead temporary insanity. Where's Kenneth now? He's, he's out in the hall. I... I hoped you'd see him. Bring him in, Anne. Let's see what we can find out. Sure, I'll try to answer anything you doctors want to ask me. Well, prior to your operation, Mr. Kennett, you suffered lapses of memory. You haven't filled in those gaps yet, or have you? I don't know whether I have or not. You can't remember or you don't want to remember? Look, Dr. Power, thanks to you people, I've regained my health. There's only one thing more that you can do for me. Turn me over to the police for trial. What about narcosynthesis, Dr. Lorison? He refused to let me try it, That's Dr. right, I refused. You refused the operation, too, but now you're glad you changed this your mind. This is something entirely different. No. No, I don't think it is. Narcosynthesis is merely a mild injection of sodium pentothal to stimulate your memory. It might be very helpful in filling in those lapses. Helpful? To whom? No, I'm sorry. This is the way I prefer it. That's my legal right, isn't it? Why are you so intent upon an immediate trial? Because, guilty or not, I'll be out of here. I'll be able to handle my finances and provide for my son's future. That's the only important thing. You love your son a great deal, don't you? Is that so unusual? Well, if you'll excuse me now, I'd, I'd like to go back to my room. There's still some tests I'd like to make. Anything you want except that narcosynthesis business. Very well, Mr. Gannett. <laughs> I still don't know why you, you can't set a time. Am I getting out of this hospital or not? Yes, I think so. It'll be another three or four days. Three or four days. For what? Ever since the operation, there's been no question about me, mentally or physically. Except the lapses of memory. Nobody expects me to remember things that happened when I was out of my mind. No mind, no memory. And that'll be your line of defense. Why not? Memory of things that happened before the operation could be quite a liability. Uh -huh, I see. Sit down, Mr. Kennett. This machine here will make a record of your muscular control and neuromuscular coordination. Any objections? None at all. Take hold of these grips, one in each hand. You try to keep your pressure the same. Now, you grip and relax, grip and relax. Here, first your left hand. That's it. Grip and relax. Grip and relax. Yeah. Grip and... well... Nothing. No, no. What's the matter? Why are you staring at your hands? I killed my wife with my hands. But you've told us that several times. Now, why would it suddenly disturb you so much? Could it happen in a single second? Could what happen? Could you strangle someone in just one second? Why, no. No, you couldn't. I didn't do it, Dr. Larson. I know now I didn't do it. In a moment, our stars will return with Act Two of High Wall. Now, here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act Two of High Wall, starring Van Heflin as Steve Kennett and Janet Lee as Dr. Ann Lotterson. Some weeks ago, Helen Kennett was murdered. At the time, Mrs. Kennett was a secretary employed by Mr. Willard Whitcomb. Now in his apartment house, Mr. Whitcomb pauses in the lobby to greet the elevator operator. Well, so it's you, Mr. Croner. Glad to see you back at work. Arthritis, Mr. Whitcomb. Been in bed for weeks. Say, that was your secretary got herself murdered by her husband, wasn't it? Yes. A terrible thing, Mr. Croner. I read all about it in the newspapers and how you told the police she worked for you and what a fine woman she was. Can we go in the elevator, please? Oh, sure. I'll take you up. 
About my arthritis, Mr. Whitcomb, doctor says I need to go to Florida. Keep plenty of sunshine, he says. Oh, but that takes money, lots of money. Do you think I ought to go to the police, Mr. Whitcomb? Police? Oh, I'm a man who knows things, Mr. Whitcomb. Not only what it says in the papers, but what it don't say. That's why I thought you ought to know what the doctor said. Croner, the penalty for blackmail in this state is very severe. And this is my floor. Sorry in such a rush, Mr. Whitcomb, but I'll be around whenever you'd like to talk to me. That's what I said, Mr. Kennett. You got a visitor. You see that little guy in the corner? Oh, I don't know him, Delaney. Want me to chase him? No. No. Let me see what he wants. You don't know me, Mr. Kennett, but my name's Croner. I'm the elevator man at 106 Maple Street. What do you want, Mr. Croner? Oh, I don't want nothing but justice. I followed your whole case in the papers. And you know, they never mentioned anything about the three of you being in that apartment. <laughs> oh, you're interested, huh? I might be. What have you got? What I've got costs money, Mr. Kennett. I'm not allowed to handle my money right now, but I'll be out of here soon. I'm being transferred to the county jail. Well, that's okay with me. I'm in no hurry. But can't you tell me what it's all about? If I tell you now, I won't have it anymore. See you in the county jail, Mr. Kennett. Delaney. Well, that was short and sweet. Delaney, I've got to see Dr. Larison. It's his day off, remember? Well, tomorrow, then, just as soon as she gets here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Croner. Hello, Mr. Whitcomb. Sorry you can't use the elevator. You'll have to walk down. Well, what's wrong with the elevator? The floor indicator got broken. I'm trying to fix it. Well, isn't that dangerous? Working on a stepladder in front of an open shaft? Yes, yes. Maybe it is. I, I think I'll come down. Besides, maybe you want to talk to me. Um, I've been thinking about your arthritis, Mr. Croner. And, uh... I'd like to make you a loan of $500. Oh, we can't cure anything for a few hundred dollars, Mr. Whitcomb. Oh, I was hoping we could. You know where I was today? I called on a fellow in the county nut house. Going to go to trial soon, I think. Wants me to testify for him. What a generous fellow he is. Suppose I sent you to Florida for the entire winter. That wouldn't prevent your arthritis from coming back next year. And the year after that? Or would it? Now, that's hard to say, Mr. Whitcomb. Be ashamed to see you suffer, Croner. Year after year. So that's why you were so anxious to see me, Mr. Kennett. That's right, Doctor. That injection, that narcosynthesis, I'm ready now any time you are. What made you change your mind? Well, I told you that, that I didn't kill her. Well, now I'm still more certain that I didn't. And maybe with this narcosynthesis, I'll recall things to prove it. Tell me, how far under will you put me? Oh, not far. You'll be able to remember everything that you say. Now, ju just sit down and I'll get everything ready. I'll start at the beginning. I remember getting off the plane, going home, seeing my mother... But the important thing is 106 Maple Street. I want to know everything that happened there. That's where I'm really hazy. The injection's ready. Flex your hand, please. Okay? Okay. What's 106 Maple Street? I never heard you mention that before. That's right. Uh, question me about that. Start there. Oh, no, no, no. Not so fast. Now, try to relax, Stephen. Just lie back and relax. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. We're going back, Steve. You're home now. Home from Burma. Oh, and your mother, she's so happy to see you again, Steve. Steve. Oh, Steve. Oh, I, I just can't believe that you're really here. Uh, now, where's the, the rest of my family, Mom? Where's Helen and, and Dickie? Why, Dickie's in school, dear. School? Oh, I, I keep thinking he's still only four years old. And <laughs> Helen, she's out shopping, I suppose. No, she's at the office. What office? Why, Helen's been working more than a year now. Working? But why? Oh, Steve, we wrote you all about it. Don't you remember? No. No, I don't. Uh, this head of mine, it, uh, well, it, it acts up every now and then. 
You didn't go through with that operation, did you? No, no, I wanted to get home. I'll, I'll have it done here. You're through with flying, aren't you, Steve? That's right, Mom, grounded. Oh, I'm so glad. Professor Burns told me they're holding that research fellowship open for you at the university. Yes, he wrote me. Well, I won't stand for any more of Helen's objections. Oh, Steve, she's young, pretty. Naturally, money seems important to her. Other things are important, too. She, uh, she got the car? Yes. Well, I'll take the bus into town and ride back with her. Well, she won't be through till five, dear. She'll be through when I get there. Don't stop, Steve. Keep going. You went to Helen's office. Helen wasn't there. She was out on an errand. 106 Maple Street. Was this another office? An apartment house. A man took me up in the elevator. He never shut up about his arthritis. I went to the door of the apartment. Forget your key, dear. The door's unlocked. Steve. Why, what, 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 darling, if I'd known you were coming, I, I would have been there to meet you. Stop it, Helen. Oh, no, Steve, you're wrong. This place, what are you doing here? You've got to let me explain, Steve. What you're thinking is all wrong. Is it? Steve, don't look at me like that. Listen to me. You're not well, Steve. You're sick. Let me take you home. You're meeting someone here, aren't you? Aren't you? I said I can explain. Steve, think of Richard. Think of your son. I'm his mother. I'm his... I can remember putting my hands around her throat. And that's all. That's all I remember. Until when, Steve? I don't know. I... I fainted or something. When I came to, I was lying on the floor. Helen was slumped in the corner. She was dead. There were things all over the floor. Cigarettes, a chair knocked over, a lamp, Helen's purse. Things that I, I'd seen when I came into the apartment. Only something else I'd seen was missing. Do you know what it was? I don't know. I can't remember. Something else was missing. Well, that's enough for now, Steve. Don't worry. The first treatment is often inconclusive. No, I've, I've got to find out. The apartment's the only answer. We can get a court order and have the police take you there. Steve, about Helen, what did you do? Do you remember? Yes. I carried her down the fire escape and put her in the car. On account of my mother and, and the boy, I, I couldn't have her found in his apartment. And then I drove the car off the bridge, trying to kill myself. Oh, Steve, don't delude yourself. Yes, I, I was right. There is something missing. And I think I know now what it is. What's missing is your willingness to admit to yourself the real reason for killing her. You had no proof she'd been unfaithful. It, it, it goes much deeper than that. It was a wartime romance, wasn't it? Yes. We met and got married. A week later, I was in Europe. Uh -huh. And after the war, the only job you wanted paid very little, and, and Helen said it wasn't enough. Am I right? Well, uh... So you went back to flying, and you hated it. Oh, admit it, Steve. Those years in Burma alone, you were building up a deep resentment against her. Steve. Uh, Steve, do you hear me? I can't uh, keep awake. I'm, I'm going to sleep. Oh, that's good. It's the best thing for you. Now, try not to think about anything. Oh, Orderly. Yes, Doctor? Uh, there's a patient resting in my office, and I'm going home now. Would you please take him to Ward C about 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. Yes, Doctor. Thank good you. Night. Keep going, <gasps> Doctor. 106 Maple Street. It was very clever to pretend you were asleep. I got out through your office window. That window was locked. I know, but you left the key in the pocket of your smock. Here it is. It was easy finding your car. Your space in the parking lot has your name on it. Well, you thought of everything, haven't you? Everything except what this is going to do to you, risking everything for nothing. For nothing? Even if I'm acquitted, I can't face my son again. What do you tell a kid of six? Forget it, Richard. When I killed your mother, I was temporarily insane. Oh, let me turn around. You can hide in the back of the car again, and, and no one will ever know that you got out. No, I've got to prove that I didn't kill her. It's the only way that I'll be able to face him again. It's worth taking any chance for. So, doctor, don't get any ideas, and don't make me jumpy. No one's going to stand in my way now. No one. 
Just because his phone didn't answer doesn't mean he isn't home now, or that he won't come home. Keep quiet. We're going up the fire escape. Oh, this is a big mistake, Steve. Please don't Start do it. climbing, Doctor. I'll be right in back of you, just in case you slip. This is it, Whitcomb's apartment. <laughs> the murderer returns to the scene of his crime. Oh, Steve, this is absurd. Now stand where you are now. All right. Let's pretend that you're Helen. I opened the front door there. You came from the hall. You started to back away. Guilt written all over you. You wanted a chance to explain, to take me home. Think of Richard. Think of your son. You're his mother. I, I put my hands around your throat. Steve, I... Steve, you're hurting me. But you're alive. You're not hurt. I blacked out. When I came to, I was, I was there on the floor. Cigarettes on the floor, like, like this. The chair. The end table. Lamp overturned. And Helen... Helen was there in the corner. Now, how did she get over there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I remember now. I remember what was missing. What is it? It's an overnight bag, Helen's. It was there next to that bookcase. Maybe it's still there. Maybe it's, maybe it's in the closet. Steve, we have to get out of here. Well, we'll get out. No, no, it's not here. This will do, this valise. But that's Whitcomb's valise. Have what you got you your lipstick in your purse? Give it to me. Lipstick? Yes, but... Yes, I... I'm writing two initials on this valise, just as they were on the other one. H for Helen, K for Kenneth. Let him find it here by the bookcase. Steve, let's go, now, please. You don't believe me. But I couldn't, I couldn't possibly have killed her. My fingers had, had scarcely closed around her throat when I, I blacked out. It was a perfect setup for Whitcomb. We'd better put everything in order, just the way we found it. No, don't touch anything. Okay. Okay, you can drive me back to the hospital now. How are you going to get back in the hospital? Somewhere I got out your window. The orderly will find me right where you said he would. And uh, you? Uh, I, I, I don't know. You'll report me. Well, I can't stop you. The guards will be making the rounds any minute now. And, and look, I came back with you, didn't I? I could have run away. Nobody will know that I've been gone if you don't turn me in. But if you do, I'll be put back in isolation. There's no release, no, no trial. I'll never be able to do anything for Richard. You'd better go in, Steve. Hurry. Hello? Anne, this is Dr. Dunlap. Oh, oh, oh yes, Dr. Dunlap. I have a message here that you called me at 8 o'clock. Something about Kenneth. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I did call you, Dr. Dunlap. I... But I... I realize now I shouldn't have disturbed you. Well, what about Kenneth? Anything wrong, Anne? No, no, Doctor, nothing at all, really. I'm sorry that I bothered uh -huh. you. You've been working too hard. Try and get a good night's rest. I'll try, Doctor. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt your reading, Mr. Kennett, but you got a visitor downstairs. Yes, I know. You know? Mr. Willard Whitcomb. Hey, what goes on here? It's a good guess, huh? Well, do you want to see him or not? He's in now with Dr. Dunlap. Oh, you bet I want to see him. Thanks, Delaney. I, uh, I should have come here long ago, Dr. Dunlap. You see, Kenneth's wife was my secretary. A splendid girl, doctor, and a devoted wife. It's very nice of you to take this interest in him, Mr. Whitcomb. Well, he'll be released for trial this week. Oh, that's fine. Then my offer will be coming along at the right time. I'm sure it'll be appreciated. Well, Kenneth's waiting for you. I'll have an orderly take you to the visiting room. You don't know me, Mr. Kennett. I'm Willard Whitcomb. Yes? You've been expecting me. Have I? Oh, uh, I must apologize for not visiting you sooner. You've been in here quite a while now. Uh, in and out. In and out. Kennett, I've been discussing your case with a very fine criminal lawyer... I was just telling Dr. Dunlap about him. Well, anyway, this friend of mine is positive he can get you an acquittal. Well, naturally, his fee is rather high, but I'll assume all costs. Why should you? Well, I feel that your wife would... Well, that is, I'm sure she'd want me to do all I can. Okay. Now, uh, when would you like to see this attorney? Don't bother, Mr. Whitcomb. You want to be acquitted, don't you? I will be. And don't let that friend of yours get away. You may need a fine criminal lawyer yourself. I know what you're thinking, Kenneth. 
and whom you're depending on. The man who came to see you, Croner, the elevator man. Haven't you heard? He can't testify for you. Poor man, he fell down an elevator shaft. The police said he died instantly as a result of the accident. Just a minute, Whitcomb. Can't be sensible, Kenneth. My offer is your only way out. Better accept it now. I, um, I'm leaving tomorrow for some of the southern sunshine Croner price so highly. And remember, any accusations you make against me will be ridiculed, the ravings of a lunatic. Croner's gone, Kenneth. There's no possible way you can prove I killed your wife. You did it! Of course I did. You admit that. Now let go of me. I'll let kill go. you if it's the last oh, thing I... Don't let him get away. He killed my wife. Oh, so this is the man you people are ready to release for trial, a homicidal maniac. Don't worry, mister. He won't be going anywhere Listen to me, please. He killed my wife. Come on, Kenneth. This Don't let him get away. Come Stop on. him. Stop him. Good afternoon. This is Airline Reservations. Uh, this is Willard Whitcomb. You have a reservation in my name for Mexico City tonight. Yes, Mr. Whitcomb. Well, I thought surely I'd have to make the trip, but uh, but now I find it won't be necessary for me to go after all. Cancel my reservation, please. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of High Wall will continue in a moment. We are fortunate to have as our guest tonight, Miss Sheila Graham, famous Hollywood columnist and radio commentator, whose knowledge of the public's taste in pictures makes her a valuable crystal ball. What did you think of the press preview of Metro Goldwyn Mayer's production, Battleground, Sheila? Distinguished is the word, Bill. You know, those of us who've seen this film are impressed with Dory Sherry's great production of the Second World War. A simple, unadorned story of a handful of wonderful guys caught in the vital Battle of Bastogne. And the cast is so true to life. Van Johnson, for instance. He plays a carefree fellow with a weakness for girls and gags. And John Hodiak, he's a cynical small-town reporter. Ricardo Montbalvin, a lonely kid, and George Murphy as Pop, whose discharge came too late. And so many other stars. I understand MGM has great plans for the world premiere in New York on Thursday. I wish I could be there. You know, Battleground is a picture we certainly would enjoy seeing again, Sheila. It's a vivid reminder of what our victory meant. Well, I think we all appreciate more than ever the little luxuries we missed during the war years, like nylon stockings and Lux flakes to take care of them. You know, Mr. Kennedy, many of my friends among the screen stars say Lux flakes are even better since the war. They are indeed. These tiny diamonds of Lux are so sheer... They burst into suds the minute water touches them. Rich suds that freshen nylons almost before you can say Lux Flakes. And they take such excellent care of stockings, even sheer nylons last twice as long. Really? You can prove that? Can and did, by a series of scientific strain tests. Stockings washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap went into runs much sooner than those washed with Lux Flakes. In fact, the Lux stockings lasted twice as long you can see why over 90% of the makers of stockings recommend Lux Flakes. Thank you for coming tonight, Sheila Graham. Now, here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of High Wall, starring Van Heflin as Stephen Kennett and Janet Lee as Dr. Ann Lorison. <laughs> it's a few hours later. Ann Lorison has just come on duty in the hospital and is met with the news that Stephen Kennett is once again in solitary confinement. Steve, what happened? Why did he put you here? I've got to get out. You've got to get me out of here. Now tell me calmly, what happened? Why don't you come in here? They said you tried to kill someone. Are you afraid to come in here? Oh, no. No, of course not. Now, who was here this morning? Whitcomb. I knew he'd come. He had to find out how much I knew. I thought I had him, but he got me instead. You remember that elevator man in his apartment? Yes. Well, he's dead. Whitcomb killed him. How do you know he that? He told me, and then he told me that he killed Helen. Boasted about it right to my face. Like a fool, I grabbed him. That's exactly what Whitcomb wanted me to do. We'll tell the police, Steve. The police? Haven't you heard? We've already told the district attorney. I'm committed here for good. Anything I say from now on will be the ravings of a maniac. And, and you've got to help me get out of here. Oh, of course I will. No, but tonight... 
Whitcomb's leaving town. He told me if I can catch him in his apartment, I can make him talk. I want you to get well, Steve. There isn't anything in the world I wouldn't do for that. Trust me. You think I belong in this room, don't you? And I've got things to do in this world, good things. A boy to take care of, a profession, work. You know that. If I don't make Whitcomb talk, I've got nothing. And I'm, I'm going out of here. Give me that key. Steve. Now, look, I don't want to hurt you. Give it to me. No, I won't. I can't. I'm don't sorry, you but I've got to have it. it. We don't know too much, Anne. After Kenneth locked you in his cell, he stole an orderly's clothes and got out through the kitchen. Then he took your car and was past the guard at the gate before the alarm was sounded. But we'll have him back before morning. You're sure of that, Dr. Dunlap? The police are closing in on him right now. They're describing him as a homicidal maniac. Well, this is all Whitcomb's doing. When he came here this morning, he taunted Kenneth. He thought that he That's could make... That's what Kenneth told you? Do you know that it isn't true? Do you know that it is? I know one thing, that we've got to stop this manhunt. He... He'll resist the police and they'll shoot him down. I've suspected for some time that your interest in Kenneth isn't completely clinical. Now look, Anne. Kenneth escaped. There's nothing we can do about it. He did it to get at the truth. He did it to clear himself. He'll go after Whitcomb. Well, you'll find the police are waiting for him. I'm off duty, Doctor. Do you have any objections if I leave? No. No, but it's raining and your car's gone. I'll call a cab. I'll phone you at home, Anne, if I hear anything. Thank you. This neighborhood sure dripping with cops, miss. You just want me to keep cruising? Yes, yes, please, just keep cruising. Hey, what's going on? How come all the cops? Oh, you'll read about it in the morning papers. Oh, so that's what you are, a newspaper lady. Will you go to the corner and then turn down Maple Street again? I... Oh, no, 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 wait. Pull over and stop. Here? Yes, yeah, stop here, right here by the church. Uh, that'll be uh, $3. Oh, to... here, take it. Good night, lady. Steve. Steve, it's me, Ann. Walk down the alley. Oh, Steve, I'm so glad I found you. I've been cruising up and down those streets for an hour. Stop playing policeman, doctor. I'm not going back. Steve, I want to help you. That's why I'm here. Don't be a fool. Your whole life will be ruined if they find you with me. I'm trying to tell you that it doesn't matter. Steve, if Whitcomb isn't guilty, if he doesn't confess, then there's nothing. Nothing for either one of us. Well, we can't... We can't stay here. There's nowhere to go. Police are all over the neighborhood. There's a cafe a few blocks away. It's in the opposite direction. Come on, let's start walking. Those clothes you're wearing. Where did you get them, Steve? Gas station near Eastbury. The attendant got suspicious when I stopped for gas. I took his clothes in his car. Steve, you... you no, didn't... no, I, I didn't touch him. I locked him oh. in the washroom and kept going. Anne, I'm, I'm wasting time here. Look, be sensible, Steve. There's no possible way you can reach Whitcomb tonight. Look, why don't you come to my house? We can talk things over there and... And you can see Richard. Richard? Uh-huh. I've had him ever since that first day. But you told me of Mrs. Ferguson. I know, I know. She's, she's my aunt. He's been with you all this time? Yes. He likes it there, Steve. Oh, he's a wonderful little boy. Hey, Tom Conover, my pal Tom, well, what do you know? Well, <laughs> well, don't you remember me? I'm sorry, Chum, but I'm afraid you're mistaken. You're not Tom Conover from C Cincinnati? Uh, do you mind? Oh, deeply sorry, sir. Sorry, madam. Hey, wait up. Bring us a drink. Now, just a minute. Oh, permit me, madam. My name is Pinky. Might I inquire as to yours? Uh, Betty. Look, will you please stop annoying us? We're busy here. Oh, well, simmer down, pal. Simmer down. Just trying to pour a little milk into human kindness, that's all. Ann, I want you to go back to the hospital. I'm going to have another try at Maple Street. Oh, it's suicide, Steve. The police have you down as a homicidal maniac. And all this talk about your son. You've got to live for him... If for no other reason. If you thought it was so hopeless, why did you bring that stuff along with you? What do you mean? What stuff? When you opened your purse before, that little box, a hypodermic needle, isn't it? Oh. Sodium pentothal? Well, I, I thought if you ever did find Wickham, it, it might help us to get at the truth. Well, then let's start finding him. I tell you, we can... Oh, wait a minute. What is it? That drunk just now. I've got an idea. Uh, you, Pinky... Are you insulting me? That's what you did, you insulted me. But I, I want to apologize. You want to... Oh, well, that's more like it, Jack. 
How did you know my name's Jack? Well, uh, so it is. That's right, and you've already met my wife. Uh, look, how'd you like to hop in a cab and take a little ride? I'll explain the whole thing about why I look like Tom Cano. Well, fine, fine. If this lovely little lady goes with us... Well, the lady's busy, uh, has to look after the baby. You and I will pay a visit to a very interesting fellow. Oh, no, you don't. You're not going any place without me. I shall say not. Well, let's uh, not argue about it here. Come on, we'll find a taxi. I still think we should stop at Ann's house, Jack. Yeah, Ann's house. A foursome. We can have a real nice party. I got a better idea, Pinky. Why don't you drop me off and you and Betty step out for some dancing? I'll take care of the baby alone. Oh, what a wonderful friend. What a wonderful friend. Oh, no, no. No matter what Jack says, I'm going with him. I don't think he'll be able to take care of the baby by himself. Oh, just when I get all set for a big evening, you got to take care of the baby. Oh, he's a real problem child, Hey, Pinky. driver. Yes, sir? Uh, turn around. Take us to 106 Maple Street. Watch it, Lieutenant. There's a car coming down the street. It's okay, Sergeant. It's a cab. Yeah? No, yeah. Looks like it's stopping here, though. A lot of people live in here. It's a big apartment house. And two men and a dame. Now, keep your eyes on them. Sorry, we couldn't make a night of it, Pinky. How about a rain check, huh? Oh, I wish you wouldn't go home. Please, I beg you. Look, how about another little drink, Pinky? Betty, just a little bitchy wet you want, huh? You know what, Pinky? I think you're drunk. She thinks I'm drunk. Hey, officer, come on down here and arrest me. She says I'm drunk. People better get moving. We're trying to keep this street clear. You heard him, Pinky. Uh, how about uh, dinner Tuesday night? Uh, at my house. Fine, fine. Uh, how much, driver? Oh, no, no, no. Driver, his money's no good. Besides, I want to ride some more. Thanks, Pinky. See you later. Yeah, K kiss the baby for me, Betty. Don't forget now. Don't you worry, pal. I won't forget. Keep walking in straight through the lobby. Then what? The stairs. Uh, good evening, officer. Just a minute. Yes? You live here? Well, you don't think we're playing games, do you? What are you policemen doing here anyway? Never mind what we're doing here. Just get in your apartment and lock the door. Well, of all the nerve. So far, so good. Thanks. Who is it? Alloran and Schaefer again, Mr. Whitcomb. Oh, uh, just a minute. Okay to use your phone again? Why, certainly. Anything new? Not a thing, Mr. Whitcomb. Well, oh, this is Captain Halloran. Give me the roof. And who's this? Oh, okay, Sam. This is Halloran. Just been touring the block all quiet. Anything else for me? Hmm? When? Oh, okay. We'll be around. Calling you back in an hour. Well, you can relax, Mr. Whitcomb. They caught him? Mm, just about. Picked himself up an outfit of clothes and car near Eastbury. Headed for the state line. State cops will have him by morning. Come on, Chief. Oh, uh, the... There's no hurry, gentlemen. Uh, time for a drink, haven't you? I don't think we better, Mr. Whitcomb. Oh, but, but you're not leaving. Don't worry. We'll be in the building. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, I, I feel very sorry for Kenneth. Poor, demented fellow. Seems to have nothing to look forward to except a, a lifetime in a padded cell. He'd be better off dead. He'll probably wind up that way. Well, here's the elevator. We'll check with you from time to time, Mr. Whitcomb. Uh, yes, but... Uh, yes, thank you. Don't raise your voice, Whitcomb. Ken. And move away from that door. Ann, stay where you are in there. The police. They'll be back. Sure. I'll call them when I want them. It was a nice break you gave me, leaving your door open when you walked to the elevator. They've orders to shoot. You'd better give yourself up. I'll kill you before anyone gets here. The law says that I'm insane. I'm not responsible. You fix that. Oh, wait, Kenneth, wait. I can hide you here. I, I, I've got money. You can get out of the country. Plenty of money. Now, just let me open this door and I'll... Yeah. <laughs> Hey. All right, Ann. Come here. What happened? He had a gun in the drawer. I don't think he wants to fight anymore. Or do you, Mr. Whitcomb? Don't. Don't. Right. You ready, Ann? I'm all set. Can you hear me, Mr. Whitcomb? I'm going to give you an injection of sodium pentothal. You can't resist. You're going to tell the truth. Can you hear me, Mr. Whitcomb? 
You're going back to the last time you saw Helen Kennett. You're going to remember everything that happened, and you're going to tell us, Mr. Whitcomb, you're going to answer all our questions. Truth. Well, I guess I guess this is it. Yes, Mr. Whitcomb? Tell a couple of those policemen there in the lobby to come right up. Anything wrong up there? Mr. Whitcomb, these men want to hear about it, too. She told me that, that her husband had found her here. He was over there on the floor, unconscious. She said he's He kept coming toward me, Willard. He grabbed my throat and then... Then, well, I don't know what, he faded or something. Stop being hysterical, Helen. But we've Helen. got to think of something now before he comes, too. We can't afford a scandal. It's quite a surprise, Helen, his coming home. It's a shame. Oh, I'll divorce him, Willard. You don't have to worry about anything. And after a little while, we can... Where are you going? I'm going to take a long walk. And when I return, I shall expect to find you and your husband out of here. What does that mean? I'm terribly sorry, my dear, but after all, he is home now, isn't he? Oh, no, you don't. You're not running out on me. I'm afraid there's very little you can do about it. I'll show you what I can do. I'll smear your name in every newspaper in town. I'll... I'll... Oh, no. No, I... I don't mean that, darling. Just what do you mean, oh, Helen? please, darling, don't you see? I'll need you. I'll be left with nothing. He's out of his mind. How do I know he won't finish what he started trying to kill me? What happened then, Mr. Whitcomb? Who killed Helen? I did it. Only way out. She'd have ruined my life. But now you're safe, aren't you? You've just killed Helen, so now you're safe. Yes. They'll blame Kenneth. They'll have to. I'll leave them here. Both of them. Go back to the office. What about the bag, Helen's overnight bag? You can't leave it here. I'll take it with me. Go out the back way, make sure no one sees me. I, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk anymore. Maybe you won't have to. I think the policeman here is satisfied. Yes, I think we are. Now, how long before he snaps out of this? Oh, just a few minutes. That is if I stop questioning him. Well, we're all going down to the DA's office. Get this on the record. It's against the law to use drugs on prisoners, even a confessed killer like Whitcomb. But you'll tell us the whole story again when we get downtown, won't you, Bub? What? What, well, what happened? What are you talking about? Come on, let's go. Ready, Kenneth? Now, you too, Doctor. We'll need your testimony. It's been quite a night, Anne. Well, I finally got you home, didn't I? So this is where Richard's lived all this time? Yes. Where's his room? Right at the head of the stairs. Darling, you know he hasn't seen you since he was four years old, and, and he's asleep. I don't think it I Yeah, know. sure, I'll, uh, I'll take it easy. All right. Anne, please come with me. Oh, Steve, thank you. Our stars will return in just a moment for their curtain calls. If you have trouble, trouble, trouble with washing dishes, change to Lux Flakes, and they will bubble, bubble, bubble your troubles away. Make rich suds that work faster, keep hands much smoother, softer. Let L-U-X bubble your troubles away. Yes, you can get rid of red, rough, dishpan hands simply by changing from strong soaps to Lux Flakes for dishes. Lux Flakes are actually kinder to hands. Hundreds of tests prove it. Try these gentle suds for your dishes. See for yourself how soon your hands are soft, smooth, lovely again. Lux Flakes are thrifty, too, because they go further. Ounce for ounce, Lux Flakes wash up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps tested. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. The lights are up and our stars come down stage again. Here they are, Van Heflin and Janet Lee. <laughs> well, I think that applause says it all. Thank you, Bill. You know, I'm beginning to feel as though I, I lived in the Lux Radio Theater. <laughs> That's fine, Van. There's no one we'd rather have with us often. 
And I hope you'll be another star boarder, too, Janet. Well, so do I, Mr. Keeley. It's your first appearance here, isn't it, Janet? Yes, it is, Van. But with a veteran Lux Theater man like yourself around, I, I knew there was nothing to worry about. <laughs> You've just come back from the East, haven't you, Janet? That's right. I went to Pittsburgh for the world premiere of the new metro golden Mayor picture, That Foresight Woman. With the other stars all in Europe, you represented the cast then, huh? Yes. Greer Garson, Errol Flynn, and Walter Pigeon all happened to be abroad. I know the people in Pittsburgh were happy to have such a charming representative. Why, thank you. I want you to know that you had a representative on the trip, too, Mr. Keeley. I never travel without a box of Lux Flakes tucked in my bag. Oh, that's proving you're a very smart girl, Janet. Now, Bill, won't you tell us about next week's play? It's a hit musical, Van, with two of Hollywood's top musical stars. The play is the 20th century Fox success, Mother Wore Tights. And the stars are the same ones you saw in the picture, Betty Grable and Dan Daly. The play has a wonderful love story and a lot of grand songs for Betty and Dan. Well, the audiences will love that, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thank you both. (laughs) Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Grable and Dan Daly in Mother Wore Tights. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Van Heflin and Janet Lee appeared by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of The Red Danube, starring Walter Pigeon and Ethel Barrymore. Heard in tonight's cast were Donald Randolph as Whitcomb, Raymond Largue as Dr. Dunlap. And Gerald Moore, Herbert Ellis, Leo Cleary, Joan Banks, Bill Johnstone, Jay Novello, Shepard Menken, Cliff Clark, Gwen Delano, Bob Griffin, Ruth Parrott, Lou Krugman, Alan Reed Jr., and Eddie Marr. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Mother Wore Tights. Starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mother Wore Tights, starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, beautiful sound quality on this. And this one was a very early performance by Janet Lee, who'd go on to fame for things like Psycho in 1960. But when she uh, did this uh, radio uh, play, she was only 22 years old. In fact, this is one of those plays where both the leads were not in the original movie. In the original, it was Robert Taylor and Audrey Totter, with Whitcomb being played by Herbert Marshall. Lee was quite a bit younger than uh, Trotter. Totter was 29, and Lee is just past 22. And you can hear a lot of the youth in her voice, but I think she really is convincing at the more tense scenes of the story. This episode is also interesting because you have... Both actors who were stars of Philip Marlowe's ongoing series appearing in the same radio production. This is a production that does bear some comparison to another uh, radio play we played a year or two back. Ingrid Bergman starred in a Hitchcock film called Spellbound, which also dealt with a female psychiatrist helping someone under her care who had been charged with murder. 
Well, I don't think Spellbound was a perfect story. I think it is probably better than this one in every way. Though that's not to say this is horrible or anything. It's a bit melodramatic, but it's really well acted. And there are some interesting uh, twists and moments in here. Even if it's a little bit predictable as to who done it. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Join us back here tomorrow for Nightbeat, and then on Tuesday, we bring you The Lone Wolf. In the meantime, send your comments.